I'm back again, just like Slim Shady, for more shit. Are you ready? So, five more things to uh, discuss here. Again, spoiler alerts, if you care about that sort of thing. Um, next up, uh, or first up for this round, oh, hair, long hair, not mine, um, is another book in the Marvel, uh, the new Marvel book series that's for like uh, heroines and unknown stories and stuff like that. And it is called Elsa Bloodstone Bequest. This book is, is, is about Elsa Bloodstone, who's a character I have no idea ex existed before this book. Uh, she's a superhero who... Um, uh, her father lived for hundreds and hundreds of years, maybe thousands of years. I think it was hundreds. Um, I forget his name right now, but he basically discovered this meteor that crashed on earth and took shards from it with, which is what's around her neck here. It's a, it's the bloodstone, um, which gives people superpowers and can extend their lifespans and stuff like that. Um, he eventually passed, uh, when Elsa was a bit younger and uh, she didn't have the best of relationships with him. So that's kind of setting up the family thing here and, and how she gets her powers from this shard. So basically by trade, she is a monster hunter. So the book starts when she's in, I believe, Edinburgh, Scotland, hunting uh, at some sort of cemetery or graveyard, hunting rat men and, and clearing out an infestation of rat men. As after she's cleared them out, she gets attacked by this squad of black clad uh, mercenaries and she's like, what the hell? But she's got these superpowers and basically almost can't be destroyed because she's got healing abilities and is like, what the hell were they after, right? They're after her shard. Um, when she gets back to the US, Boston, I believe is where she is, um, and she gets back to her estate, uh, her assistant Adam is like, uh, who's actually a monster himself, but a good monster, uh, some sort of Frankenstein thing going on there with him. Um, well, there's somebody here to see you and uh, it's this 60 year oldish woman named Mahela who claims she is Elsa's sister um, not from the same mother I don't believe but their father is is the common uh, family trait here so Elsa's like yeah I don't believe it whatever um, but eventually she convinces her enough to stick around and, and figure things out and uh, and so Mahela explains to Elsa that uh, a team of mercenaries just like the ones that attacked Elsa attacked her um, and stole her shard and now she's she can't live without it and so eventually she presents Elsa with enough evidence that she may possibly be her sister and stuff so they agree to uh, get try and get this back and so they try and get it back by um, trying to track these mercenaries by 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 visiting all of her father's their father's uh, hidden bases around the world. So they go to, uh, oh God, where was it? Um, out on some island in Bahamas, uh, Moscow, Russia, uh, just outside the Savage Land in the Arctic Circle sort of thing. But th this team of mercenaries beats them to the punch each time. And, and the longer it goes on, the longer Mihaela freaks out about not having her shard. And Elsa, oh, New York City at an old bar. That was one of them as well. And that's when Elsa finally, after that debacle, uh, she finally realizes that there, there's something Mihaela is not telling me. And I think I just figured it out. She's a vampire. The Bloodstone had actually prevented her from turning fully into a vampire and allowed her to le lead a normal life. And that's why she's freaking out so much that she doesn't have it anymore because she doesn't want to succumb to being a full, full on vampire. But Elsa's like, dude you gotta learn to cope you can't just mask it right so um they struggle on and struggle on and finally um uh, confront the person who's behind the theft of her of Mihaela's uh, bloodstone shard and it's a certain villain that doesn't get a lot of action but is very cool and I won't say anymore and it, it kind of ends as they face off against this uh this fiend sort of thing so that's what that story is all about very cool um, next up, oh, I don't have a thing for it because we watched it on Netflix. And it is the cool, cool foreign series from South Korea called Squid Game. Squid Game is a nine episode series that was picked up by Netflix uh, not too long ago. And it's all the talk lately. Um, it's a South Korean production. So I... I still don't know any of the characters' names. I couldn't really clue in on, on how to say them and stuff like that. So um, it focuses on this one guy at the start. And he, he's he got no money. He gambles any money he has away. 
him and his wife are divorced. Their daughter, he never barely gets to see her and he wants to buy her stuff, but he can't because he has no money. So then he gambles more. <laughs> and his mom is like, you can't waste all our money. Like we need to, and she's old and got sick feet and stuff. So his life is just a mess, right? Um, one day he's approached in the subway by a guy and they, who offers him a chance to play this game and earn some money. And, and it's, they're throwing paper things on the ground at each other and they have to flip the one over. Um, and uh, he plays in, with this guy, and at the end, this guy leaves him a card, I believe is how it worked, with uh, almost the PlayStation uh, shapes on it, is what it looks like, and uh, with a number on the back. So this guy calls the number and opts in on what is a game, um, and, and is soon uh, captured, basically kidnapped almost in a way, not kidnapped, but taken in a van and knocked out with gas, and they, he shows up at this facility, which he doesn't know where, with all these other people all clad in the same green jumpsuits with all with numbers on them. And uh, he is the last player at this facility, number 456. And uh, so eventually the players are rounded up and said, you uh, you all have troubles in your life, financial difficulties. This is your chance to, to win a game, claim a whole bunch of money and make your life better. Everybody's like, okay, but what? Like, right? So then they get taken to the first game, and the game is stop and go. So, like, you know, they say go, and then you got to run, and they say stop, and you got to go go completely still. And if you don't stay still, you're out. Only in this case, if you're out, they shoot you dead. So this is a game that is of dire consequence, right? So all these people are trapped in this place, whether they came willing, well, they mostly all, they all came willingly, but once they get there, like, they don't want to be there. They don't want to die, right? So, so then it's just this... Uh, the, this journey of this guy and the, and the friends he makes during the game and also the enemies he makes during the game as they work their way through the squid game in order to earn these millions of uh, dollars in, in whatever their local currency is and uh, yeah and there's lots of twists and turns along the way there's an undercover cop whose brother went missing a while back who's who infiltrates the island and, and, and be, uh, gains a costume to be uh, impersonate one of the staff and and so there's lots of stuff going on and it's only nine episodes like I said but uh, it, it, it seemed longer than that because a lot goes on and it's a really crazy premise and something really unique and just really really fun and so it's it's it was filmed in, in, in Korean but it's dubbed in English so some of the dialogue is really funny too which adds a, a lot of personality to it and it's just uh, a really cool fun but a little bit violent kind of series, but uh, some of the games they play are insane. I, th I was like, I, I just thought if I'm ever put in one of these situations, like I know I'd re do really well at that game, but that one I'd probably just freeze up and and probably die no problem, right? So <laughs> it's really neat show, really cool premise. Uh, it's only nine episodes, so if you know, it's not much to invest yourself in if you, if you're not sure if you're gonna like it or not. It's only nine episodes, so just give it a go. Next up. <clears throat> Voltron, Legendary Defender. Um, this is ep uh, seasons three through six, which only contains 26 episodes in total. It goes seven, six, six, seven, I think it is. So leaving off from the second season, um, you know, Voltron and, and the Voltron Force have struck a, a good blow against the um, the Gora. King Zarkon is, is kind of on his deathbed. He's really injured um, and, and, uh, and is pretty much out of the picture. So Voltron's really happy. So they start recruiting, although Shiro has gone missing. They don't know where Shiro went during the action. So they're, they have nobody to pilot the Black Lion. But over, other than that, everything's good. So they start doing these um, publicity things all around the universe on different planets. Like where Voltron, uh, the lions show up and do a show. And they kind of pump everybody up in order to try and get these planets and systems to join the coalition with Voltron. Um, in order to band together and, and fight against what's left of the Gora uh, fleet in force um, instead of just always bowing in submission to them uh, to make the galaxy a safer place, a more united front uh, and uh, just make things much better going forward. Along the way, there's lots of stuff that comes up. Uh, Shiro's missing, like I said, so there's nobody to pilot the Black Lion. Um, Allura eventually bonds with the Blue Lion um, and Keith shows a bond with the Black Lion, and then so then Lance goes to the Red, I believe is how it works. So there's a bit of a shift in the team, so they're able to once again pilot the full force and form, form Voltron. Um, but eventually Shiro shows up, he escapes from his imprisonment there, he shows back up, but something's a little off with him. Um, so Keith kind of leaves Voltron because 
he's not that much into it anymore and he wants to fight for the Blades of Remora, I think they're called, which is kind of a a covert kind of special ops force who are planning a little more, not dishonorable, but a little more nasty kind of things than Voltron and their more honorable kind of tack on things uh, are going. So he goes off and does that, but still stays in touch with Voltron. Um, and a, Prince Lotor comes in to take over from, from Zarkon, but not all of the Gora are on board with him, him being the new leader. So there's a new leadership ceremony that takes place and the Gora are in fighting. Uh, Keith eventually meets his mother, Pidge, uh, Ronde, or reunites with her brother Matt, and eventually they track down their father and get him back from King's Archon, who is revived by Hagar. Um, so there's all sorts of things that happen. And eventually Lotor and Zarkon battle, and Lotor kills Zarkon once and for all, so he's out of the picture. And then Lotor tries to take over the, the Gaura once and for all, saying, I killed Zarkon, I completed that ceremony. I'm your rightful leader, but still not everybody's on board. And eventually Lotor is captured by the Voltron force, but feeds them enough information that they start to think, you know what, he does want um, the galaxy to be a better place and, and to take over the Gora and, and lead them on a more peaceful mission. Um, so he's got a whole plan in, in action. And Shiro seems to be really on board with Lotor's uh, plan. And so he steers the Voltron force that way. And eventually Lotor and Allura develop kind of romantic feelings that don't go that far before they realize Lotor has betrayed them and Shiro is not who he says he is and then it all um, ends with kind of this clash with the Voltron Force against Lotor and Shiro um, in, in the final episode and that's kind of how it ends. Now I've read that there's actually two more seasons after this uh, which I thought I thought it was all tidally wrapped up at the end of season six and that was the end of the series but apparently there's two more seasons. They have not been released on DVD yet, so and at this point I don't know if they will, so I don't know if I'm going to have to watch them on Netflix or give it a while longer, see if they do eventually release it on DVD, because that's the way I prefer my shit. Um, but anyways, great great show, The Voltron Force, a great reimagining of what was an awesome 80s cartoon. Next up, F9, finally watched the latest Fast and Furious movie, and it starts off with some flashbacks of Dom Toretto when his dad was racing stock cars and eventually that's how he met his demise during a race when he got in a confrontation with a, a dirty driver that clipped him and sent him into a spin and the car blew up and uh <clears throat> so dom's kind of reminiscing on those memories and it flashes to current times which is two years after the last movie dom is living with letty on this kind of farm kind of house with his young son brian and uh he's kind of retired from all that lifestyle but suddenly uh roman Tej and uh, oh, the, the new girl. I forget the British girl. I forget her name. They show up saying, look what we found. So Kurt Russell, is it? No. Yeah, that's who it is. Mr. Nobody, the, the sunglasses secret agent guy, sent a, a video message through to them as his plane was being attacked and went down in Central America. And they find out that Cypher, the, the enemy from the last movie that, that was responsible for Dom's wife's death, um, was the one who brought the plane down. So Dom's, at first he says, no, I'm not in that lifestyle anymore. But then he gets a clue that his brother, which I don't think we knew he had a brother, um, was involved in this. So then he's like, I'm on board. So then they go to Central America. They, they uh, spark this little mission. They get to the plane that went down. No sign of Mr. Nobody, but they do find this little half a sphere that is the object that they were sent there to get. And uh, it seems to be some sort of a weapon that could be really dangerous in in the wrong hands. So they're trying to escape the local militia of the country um, with this device. Um, and that's when John Cena arrives, and that's Dom's brother. And he takes the thing from them, escapes in his Ford, a Mustang, jumps off a cliff, and a stealth bomber or something swoops down, scoops him up, and, he, and he's off. And they're like, what the hell? That guy's your brother? And how the hell does he have a jet that picks up his plane in midair, right? So... The rest of the movie is just Dom and his team going after, uh, I think his name's, um, shit, I forget what his name is. It starts with a J. Um, after his brother's kind of, uh, his brother's being financed by this rich Englishman, um, and together they, they plan on using this weapon to rule the world, basically, right? So it's Dom's team going after his brother's team in an effort to get this weapon back from them and, and 
you know, make the world safe and stuff. And, and the movie gets pretty ridiculous as Roman and Tej eventually go into space in a Pontiac Fiero, which is fantastic. Um, and, and so it's just this kind of sequence of events as the movie unfolds uh, across the end of it. Where where they finally build to this confrontation with with uh, Dom's brother in this in this wealthy Englishman as 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 everything comes to a head. So like I said, Fast and the Furious isn't some a movie you take that serious. Maybe in the beginning, but then it got more and more crazy with the stunts and in the in the premises as it went on. You know, um, but the action's fantastic. Like you just can't. And, and and by now they got nine movies or whatever, right? You're used to the cast. You love it. You love everything about it. Even if they go to space and it's ridiculous, it's still fantastic, right? So. Last up, PS3 game, Aliens, Colonial Marines. Me and James played this together. It's a two-player game. Um, it takes place a little while after the Aliens movie, um, like a number of weeks after, where uh, a Colonial Marine team is sent into the Sulaco, which is in orbit above LV-426, where the infestation was during the Aliens movie. Um, and, uh, and they're after... I forget what they're after, but they're, they're checking out what's going on. They got a distress signal. Something went on, and they're there investigating it. And they come up against the aliens, of course, and some mercenaries that were hired by Wayland Yutani to corral these aliens. And, of course, they want to weaponize them and experiment on these aliens. So uh, this Marine team, not only... They, they have this two-headed monster to fight against as they infiltrate the Sulaco and then end up down on Hadley's Hope on the planet... And, and it's just this kind of fight for survival while they try and prevent this alien threat from, from going abroad and, and bring down Wayland yutani right? And along the way, Corporal Hicks shows up and he becomes part of the team um, and explains kind of what happened during the Aliens movie, right? So it's kind of a cool little tie-in to that. So really fun game, only 11 missions. Um, but a lot, like, I love anything Aliens, um, and so this game was a lot of fun, and I really liked how it was two-player, so me and James got to experience it together. The game got really bad reception when it was released. Uh, they, they, they panned the graphics, the gameplay, the AI. I didn't think it was that bad. The only problem I had with the game was the fact that it was really hard to see, which, I mean, an Alien thing, movie, whatever game, it's, it's usually dark. Like, that's kind of the, one of the scariest part is that it's usually dark and you got these black aliens that you can't even fucking see coming at you out of the out of nowhere, right? So, but it, it made it really hard to tell, like, where is... I'm getting hacked into pieces right now and I can't tell where this fucking thing is, right? So, that, that was my only kind of downside to the game. But other than that, for the PS3 era, I thought the, the gameplay was fine. Uh, the graphics were fine. Like, I thought everything worked fine other than it was dark. Now, comparing it to Alien Isolation, which was another PS3 Aliens game, night and day graphics. But Alien Isolation, to be fair, set the bar way up here and looked like it could actually have been a PS4 game, not a PS3 game to me, right? So so they really outdid themselves with that game. But, but Alien Isolation for the PS3, I thought was just a well-done game for the most part, and I thought fit right into that area of gaming in terms of average everything you know uh, average or above average everything and and i had no problem with it so and we had a lot of fun playing it and uh and uh yeah that's it for now so take what you can out of this or ignore it all if you like anything i like you'll probably like it as well if you hate the stuff i like fuck you <laughs> just kidding sayonara